Hey, welcome back to the Jesus Discussion. We're glad you joined us. Um, our passion here is just to uh, get back to trying to answer the, the question, who was Jesus? And, you know, go back to this ancient audience and, and these ancient people and, and try and understand where they were coming from and, and how they were having this conversation. Uh, we've been going through the good news according to Mark or the gospel according to Mark. And what we want to do is is make sure that we don't zoom so far into the details of Mark that we forget that Mark is a real person who wrote a real letter like a normal human being, you know, so it has a, a, a coherence for the whole. So when you read the whole, it makes sense. And then the whole is made up of these individual parts. And that's why we've encouraged in past, episode, past episodes, and we continue to encourage you to do something called a pre-read, where you set aside 10 or 15 minutes, and you don't worry about getting every detail, but you just try and read as much of, you get all the way to the end of Mark um, in, the, in the 10 or 15 minutes by kind of skimming through. And what you're doing is not trying to really understand Mark per se, you're trying to place where things are happening and what the sequence of events are. So we thought we would do an episode today that would just be kind of a summary of where we've been so far and how all of the story is adding up to make sense as a whole story. So that as we continue to go through smaller chunks, those smaller chunks uh, make sense to the whole. Um, so Everett, would you, would you have anything to add to, to help our, our listeners kind of understand uh, what I'm saying about that? Yeah, sometimes one of the things we do is we approach the Bible uh, differently than we would approach uh, other literary works. And, and uh, you know, from my perspective, the Bible is special, but we need to read it like we would read anything um, and understand uh, the time in which it was written, the circles of context. And uh, I'm reading a, a book now, and the author is is giving credits, and he says, Miss, M-I-S-S, so-and-so, and Miss, so-and-so. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> when was this, was this written? And I look back, and it was first written in 1934. Hmm. So... It's not an affront to women. It's just the way they did things in 1934, and it might it might be offensive. But nobody in 1934 thought it was offensive. So we just have to take those things into consideration when we're reading a book, and we have to understand the culture and the context of the author's situation whenever we read anything. So we we take the the normal rules of interpretation, and we can apply those same rules of interpretation to the Bible and and see what the author is saying, yes, in each individual part, but that's part of a, a whole that those individual parts fit into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you're reading a, a book, say it's fiction or, or nonfiction, you know, uh, if it's a, a well-written book, it usually doesn't bring in things that... that uh, don't relate to what it's trying to say. Um, there, there's a, uh, I think it's Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, you know, something to the effect of uh, there shouldn't be any bit stroke of word or, or phrase or sentence in your writing that doesn't advance the story forward. That's, that's his critique on what makes, you know, one element of, of what makes good writing. But I, I think it's a good rule of thumb to, to look at these people as, um, not just trying to blindly fill in all of this stuff because they're overwhelmed about, oh my gosh, Jesus, but they perceive themselves to be living in the realized reign of the Messiah, and they're writing literature to invite people to join in that um, reign, join into that kingdom. And so they're trying to communicate a, a message that would make sense to these ancient people. And and as you said... Um, I think that when I read and I understand Mark, I think the things that Mark is saying have this divine merit to their claims. This, um, uh, I, I believe in them and they say fantastic things that, that I believe, but I get to those fantastic assertions because 
I understand the literature, not by going around the literature or trying to make the literature mean something that it never meant. Right. And one one of the things I always stress is that, you know, we're, we're reading about stories about Jesus, his teaching, his miracles, uh, his his life, at parts of his life that are recorded here for us. And we we always have to ask two questions is is not only what is going on, but why is Mark including that particular event or teaching in this particular place in his story? Right. And that leads me to the next question I was just going to ask. Um <clears throat> Based on understanding Mark, we, when you read through Mark, there are indicators that aren't in other ancient letters, that aren't in the other 27 documents we collect and call the New Testament, um, that these phrases kind of indicate who the audience is. Uh, for them to use some Latin terminology, some common uh, Latin terminology that, that the average person on the street in, in the Roman Empire would understand— is one clue to who the audience is, and, and you've brought up as well the idea that every time a, a Jewish custom is 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 mentioned, it's it's explained, and um, or or a, a, a localized reference from Jerusalem, it's explained, and this gives us some clue that the audience was likely a Roman audience. Um, if if I'm not uh, would you add any other um, clues that help us kind of identify that? Right. Um, if Mark were writing to a Jewish audience, uh, or primarily a Jew- Jewish audience, then he why would he explain customs that are familiar to his audience? You know, if, if I were writing to a contemporary American audience and I talked about um, the up, upcoming fireworks festivals, you know, that are going to happen. I wouldn't need to go back and talk about the signing of the Declaration of Independence and, you know, the meaning of the 4th of July and all that, because most Americans, at least I hope, would have some uh, knowledge and familiarity with that. But if I were writing to, to someone in Asia that doesn't celebrate, you know, our holidays, then I would have the need to explain it. So it gives you a clue as to who is Mark intending this for, and that helps us understand the another level of, of context of, of what Mark is getting at with not only the stories he tells, but also the why he put those particular stories in those particular places. Right. And and you don't have to turn that into, um, that doesn't have to turn into something that, that complicates the text. It should just be something that helps inform the text. So um, once you kind of have a sense of that, then when you go back and read Mark, some of those things become a little more intuitive, and you begin to look at some of these references, and they make a little bit more sense. And... Uh, you know, even though you might not be able to quantify the explanation maybe the way others um, can in terms of the what was going on in Rome and, and the points that we've made. Uh, I, I often wonder as I read Mark, uh, Everett, it seems as though whoever was reading Mark for the first time might also have been being presented with writings uh, from the Old Testament, especially Isaiah. There's a lot of Isaiah quote in there, um, or or overtones from Isaiah. Uh, would you say it, it would be reasonable to consider whether or not someone in that audience had heard things from Isaiah or read Isaiah? Uh, yeah, it's very reasonable because otherwise, why would Mark use that? Mm-hmm. And it, it, you know, if we know the the story of the the synagogue or the local meeting place for the the, the Jews where they worship on the on the Sabbath, 
we know that uh, there were Gentiles that, um, to use a par modern parlance, that hung around, that weren't ready to convert to Judaism, but they were intrigued by what the Jews uh, were, their lives and uh, their stories, and that were attracted to um, their message. And they called these people God-fearers. And so there were a lot of uh, Roman Gentiles that would have heard lessons from, you know, what we would call the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures, that uh, Isaiah, for them, would be a familiar name. And some of the things that, that Mark uh, uses, some of the, the, the Old Testament analogies he uses, would have been at least somewhat familiar to a lot of Gentiles. Right. And so that gives us a little bit of a sense that, okay, Isaiah is something that they're talking about, but it's likely not written to the Jewish audience in Jerusalem because of all of these other uh, contexts. And it's probably not written to people um, who had absolutely no idea of anything that was going on um, surrounding Judaism, uh, uh, the, the Jewish faith, Israel, all of those kind of things. Um, so there's some culture that, that is connected. Um, and there's some speculation about, you know, who it is that, that uh, it might be written to um, that we can get to later. But the other thing that I wanted to pick up, and I, I hinted at earlier, and I kind of took a left turn here with the Isaiah stuff, but uh, there, there are a couple of dominant themes from the ancient world that keep kind of pushing in on what these first disciples and followers and, and early uh, culture of um, Jesus followers were trying to communicate. And uh, one of the things, if, if you've read, you know, we, we've suggested reading um, the Ralph P. Martin um, book, Mark, Evangelist and Theologian, but there are other books you can read by people like D.S. Russell or D.A. Carson, or, you know, you go back and, and you read books that would class in the scholarly world, but they're not trying to elevate the text and complicate it. They're just trying to give you data that helps you understand it as the people who from the from the perspective of the people who would have been hearing it for the first time, um, you'll hear some phrases and terminology, and you won't quite uh, reference it. I know one of those for me, uh, Everett, was the first time I heard uh, the phrase Marcionite, and I had to kind of infer from context what was going on. Um, so I thought, you know, maybe Everett, you could help us kind of understand a couple of these uh, the, these as I see it, these two dominant themes in Mark, that um, Mark is kind of addressing as he's trying to spell out who Jesus is and what the good news of Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, is um, about. Well, uh, just uh, briefly, uh, Marcion was a Second century guy, he was, um, he, he went to Rome and uh, claimed to be establishing the, the true community of faith. And uh, he, in Marcion's world in the early second century, um, Mark's gospel existed, as, is, as did John's and the letters of Paul and and uh, all the books that we're familiar with in the New Testament, those all existed. But they, they were circulated among the churches, and uh, the churches treasured those things, but they didn't have them in one collection. Uh, Marcion was probably the, one of the, at least, uh, the first people to put together those, some of those letters in a, in a compendium. But he... He rejected uh, some of the letters of Paul. He rejected all the Gospels except for Luke, and then he didn't like certain elements of Luke. Uh, Marcion was a little bit of an anti-Semite. So anything that was favorable to the Jews or leaned upon Jewish uh, traditions and backgrounds, he cut out of Luke. 
the community, the Christian community at the time was offended by that. And as a result, uh, began putting together collections of books, which eventually became our New Testament. So Marcion, in his anti-Semitic um, attempt to correct the Bible, um, really provided the impetus for the, the, the gathering together and the collecting of the 27 books that we have as, a, as our New Testaments. I don't, know if that, I don't know if that covers kind of what right. you wanted to... But Marcionite, the, the Marcionite uh, movement, and, and Marcion, uh, am I saying that right? Marcion? 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 Marcion, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but he represents um, a conversation that had actually been going on in the early first century uh, before the destruction of the temple and, and after the destruction of, of the temple in 70 AD, and, and kind of a vein of thought that Mark is speaking against that you've mentioned, in, in a sense, that to remove the the element of Jesus as, as the Jewish Messiah um, and present him maybe as just a miracle worker. And, you know, Gnosticism hadn't come out and, you know, Gnosticism developed a little later. So in the first century, if I'm not mistaken, we're talking about pre-Gnosticism, right? And so the early ideas of some of this Hellenistic thought. And we've brought up before something we've called the Masonic secret. So, so Jesus is always saying, hey, don't tell this person, don't, don't, don't go spread this around. Um, hey, do honor the, the religious law and go to the temple and show yourself to the priest so that you can be um, reestablished in, within the community is, is clean, but don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. Whereas a miracle worker in, in those days would come and say, look at me, I'm doing great things. Um, and so Mark in bringing up what Jesus was doing and kind of downplaying his uh, come and see, look at me um, uh, case is kind of speaking against some of the the social and cultural tension to pull Jesus toward more of this Gnostic, um, Hellenistic miracle worker kind of person. Um, am I am I mistaken on that, or or how would you uh, voice that in? How would you address that? Um, uh, again, just trying to be concise here. The Gnostics, the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word uh, for knowledge. Mm -hmm. And they, they claimed that they had, uh, that, that salvation was through secret knowledge, which of course only they had. And uh, one of the things that the Gnostics did was they denied the the hum, the full humanity of Jesus, um, Marcion came along and added a, this anti-Semitic um, element to it, so that Jesus, in in his view, is not the Jewish Messiah. In fact, um, he believed that Jesus wasn't born; he just appeared. And that, you know, he went, there was all kinds of things. One of the things he, he taught was that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament were separate gods. Hmm. And so he discounted the entire Old Testament. And so Mark's references on Isaiah and fulfillment of prophecy and all that, a Marcion would have, have none of that. And so that's a, that's a powerful element that is current in, in the Roman Empire uh, at, the, at the dawn of the second century. Right. And if it's powerful at the dawn of the second century, it came from somewhere. It's not just like Marcion just walked onto the street and said, I have an idea and I'm the only one who ever thought this. Um, right. Yeah, you're right. The, the pre-Gnostics or the, the early Gnostics um, were around for a long time before Marcion came around. Right. So there's one tension, and, and I'm probably um, misconnecting the, the Masonic secret to it. So the, so the one tension that we can see in Mark is the idea to not treat Jesus as a human. Um, he's uh, a divine entity, and he came for the secret knowledge, and he's going to give you the secret knowledge. 
And it's funny because that, you know, you, you still run into people of faith now who kind of speak about Jesus in that fashion. That, you know, well, I can give you the secret knowledge. And with my secret knowledge, um, and in some ways that defies how how public the declaration of Jesus was, especially after um, his crucifixion. Um, so there's that theme, the, the kind of anti-human theme, and there's also the miracle worker, wonder worker uh, element of Jesus. And it seems that those two themes are, there's these gravity, there, this gravity that wants to pull to one or the other. That Jesus is a human miracle wonder worker, uh, or Jesus is um, not God incarnate, born, you know, God born as man, um, but he's not human. Uh, and those two tensions were around at the time that Mark was writing, and Mark is speaking, in a sense, right in between those two tensions and really clarifying. Uh, he keeps um, pushing at one and then pushing at the other. Um, w- would you say, you probably have a better way to express those two themes as they relate to Mark. No, I don't think I do. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, the... Normally, things are written to set the record straight or to uh, try to convince somebody of something. Or and so Mark is writing in a in a cultural historical situation. He's not um, sitting in an ivory tower, disconnected from uh, the rest of humanity. But that everything he writes has a point, and and Mark clearly identifies Jesus as a human being. He shows him as a person who eats, who sleeps, who who suffers agony on the cross, and mm-hmm. and who very definitely is the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Jewish Messiah. Right, but then as we as we just went over in a, a few podcasts ago, he's also the guy who has power over nature, which is a divine characteristic. Um, and you know, in the title of the work, he is the Son of God. So understanding that those two tensions are there kind of helps keep you from taking some of the little asides and the the precision. Sometimes Mark says some things, and we don't want to take the precise thing he says and turn it into something that it isn't understanding that background kind of can can keep us from taking a turn of phrase or a statement and mis mishearing it um right and one of the things we have to guard against i think is the idea that as mark is sitting down to write this gospel He's sitting there 2,000 years ago, and he's thinking about me. This is, this is God's letter to Everett. Uh, and so that I can take each little thing and say, well, what was Mark saying to me personally? Mm-hmm. I think we have to understand what Mark is saying in a, in a larger sense. And then, once we understand that, then we can take those, those points, those uh, implications and we can say, okay, this is what it means to me now. But it's not a personal letter from Mark to me as an individual. Right. First we understand Mark, and then we we uh, think about what Mark meant, and then we consider Mark's meaning as it might apply to our lives. Um, right. But yeah, we too often, and I've heard other scholars say this, you know, it's, his, Christianity has a history of trying to read the Bible and, and only concerning themse- our, ourselves with, with what the Bible means to me instead of right. who is this guy, Mark. And I would argue that, that, you know, if love is our calling as human beings, then we need to recognize that Mark is a human being and Mark wrote a letter. And listening to what Mark says is the most loving thing we could do. Trying to get behind or around or interpret Mark for what it means to me instead of hearing Mark is really disrespectful. You know, if I wrote you a letter and you wanted to do anything than other, other than understand my meaning, 
that would be disrespectful to me as a human being, um, unloving, I would argue. I would, if you wrote me a letter, I would want to hear your meaning um, because, uh, you know, I would want to respect and, and love you as a human. And so we, we can offer these early followers the same human respect, the same love that we would give each other, that we listen and we try and understand. And, you know, if we think about the word um, <clears throat> community, um, it really begins community, communication, communion. This is all kind of the, the root meaning in there is to have something in common that you know when i speak you understand the meaning of my words and the meaning of my words is something that we share in common um whether you agree or disagree with them and we can offer offer mark that same respect um not to go too far off on on some of these themes that these these two themes we've been talking about that mark is wrestling with um in acts philip uh runs across a guy named uh simon is it when they send him um uh simon is this is this miracle worker right and they're down in uh is it samaria yeah <laughs> oh wait okay sorry <laughs> i was trying to find the the reference in acts <laughs> that's all right um I, I don't want to go too much into the story but the gist of it is um some of the early disciples were sent out somewhere and they run across this guy simon who's doing a bunch of miracles um I believe his name is Simon, and he's a wonder worker, and, you know, he wants to come to faith because he sees the, the what the disciples are doing in terms of miracles, and uh, the disciples are trying to explain to him, yeah, it's not, it's not like that, but he's like, give me this power that you have because I want to be cool and great and do wonders too, um, and so that theme of the wonder worker and the miracle worker um, and, and that kind of a sense of spirituality are not just something that is evidenced uh, by inference in, in Mark. It, it's also plainly talked about in other stories. Right. Do I need to... That was, um, uh, that was in Acts 8. Yeah, Acts chapter 8. Um, yeah. And, uh, and the, you know, they, they, they're pretty harsh with him in terms of putting him in his place over it. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, yeah. Peter says, you know, let let your money perish with you or something to that effect. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, so that's pretty tough. Chapter eight, verse 20. May your may your silver be destroyed with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Um, you have no part or share in the matter because your heart is not right before God. Um, and so anyway, that. He goes on to say, oh, whoa, wait, wait, <laughs> I take it back. Um, but it, it is evidence that that, that theme is a, is a popular theme. And Mark is trying to clarify Jesus against that theme when he's conveying the idea of the Messianic secret, which also has um, other implications. But for Mark, when he portrays Jesus as someone who says, don't tell anyone. And that's what I, what, when we say Messianic secret, we're talking about the parts where Jesus says, hey, go, but don't tell anyone. And you notice that happens uh, around Israel, but it doesn't really happen, you know, when he goes over to Decapolis. Um, in, which is which is where the Gentiles live. Right. The non-Jews. Right. And and we talked about that story with the pigs, and and he says, you know, go, go around to the town and tell people. So he's kind of... Um, not trying to uh, be seen as a miracle worker or a wonder worker in Jerusalem, uh, in, in that region. Right. And those, those guys were actually relatively common, and their goal was to get a following, to, you know, get a, get, to get some money, uh, maybe get a shot on Christian TV, <laughs> Um, <laughs> or the equivalent uh, in the first to, century <laughs> yeah but, but the idea was that they would um, they'd become the center of attention uh, so uh, kind of like a cult following uh, and Mark is saying clearly by recording Jesus' words here that Jesus is not one of those guys that's not his mission and mm -hmm. so he separates himself from these uh, these people who were uh, 
trying to to make money and get attention, and that's not Jesus' mission at all. Um, and so that's that's the messianic secret um, that Jesus uh, dispenses with at the triumphal entry. Uh, now the secret's out. Mm-hmm. He is the Messiah. But early yeah, on I, in the in the ministry, uh, it was clearly a theme. It's also evidenced in that you know you wouldn't send your emissaries out, and then when they run into someone else who's proclaiming the same message, you wouldn't say no, 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 go ahead and let him do it, right? You you would if you were trying to be the center of attention in the miracle worker, you wouldn't try and empower others um, to speak the same message. You would want all that all that right. coming back to you. So, so the very fact that you know he right. sends out the twelve, as we're going to see later, and then he he says, you know, uh, if if they're if you run across someone doing something and they're you're not against us, they're for us. So, don't worry about it. You know, let's not right try and keep all this together um, as as just centered on me. Um, in that wonder worker kind of way. So maybe that's helpful uh, in terms of the themes and the stories that that we've uh, been going along with since the beginning, kind of understanding two of those themes. We thought we'd do a different kind of an episode today where, you know, maybe every once in a while we'll just kind of catch up on the broader themes. And then uh, next episode we'll be right back in with Mark chapter 5, verse uh, 21 through 43. But it's important as we read that just like you said ever that we're not getting so into the details and we're not so the details are great and you can't have a hole without the details but you know you you want to find your way through the details so that the whole makes sense um so that you don't have a right. bunch of you can't go ahead you can't have a forest without trees right but you can miss the forest if you just focus on one or two trees right or get lost in circles, you know? I mean... Right. Yeah. All right, well, if there's uh, nothing else um, that we can really add for an overview at this point, uh, I want to encourage you to continue to do a pre-read. I, 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 we can't stress that enough. I mean, um, continuing to go through Mark for the overview really helps settle things down when you get into the details. Uh, if as always, if you have questions or, or comments or critical thoughts, send them to questions at thejesusdiscussion.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever podcasts are posted. Um, our main post is on soundcloud.com forward slash the Jesus Discussion, and we invite you to leave comments or, or start a dialogue there. Um, all comments and all thoughts will be addressed with you know equal respect. Um, and... Uh, think that about covers it you have anything to add everett no i do not all right well thanks for tuning in to the jesus discussion Uh, we look forward to catching up with you next time have a great week